Thank you, everybody. It is a special treat to be here today. I had conversations with my old high school cross-country coach who's here and will be speaking after me. So I've uh, been wor working on this for the past three years, and I've always wanted a chance to come down to the toledo Perrysburg area. So thank you for the invitation. I think I have it. OK. So this illustration is not an exaggeration. This is actually the equipment I used to get my doctorate. What you'll immediately notice is that it's big, difficult to use, and very, very expensive. This whole rig cost about half a million dollars. Now, because these rigs are so big and expensive, if you want to study the brain, you have to go to graduate school and bang on doors with professors. And if they like you, they let you in your lab, and then eventually you might be able to do some science on your own which I think is kind of a tragedy. Um, in other fields of science, such as electrical engineering, computer science, and astronomy, you can start as early as you want to. But in the life sciences, it's still only relegated to the large research university. And so the barrier to entry is very high. So we'll talk a little bit about some theory before we go into the experiment. So if you just look at the heart, you can see that it has chambers, and it's a type of muscle. So you can clean some insight into how it functions. If you look at the bladder, you'll see it's a bag of some sort that's holding something. Um, if you look at the lungs, maybe you can kind of figure out that there's some sort of exchange mechanism for air occurring. But if I showed you this, a brain, would you look at this and say, oh, I get it. <laughs> I'm yeah. No, I mean, so to study the brain, you need to study living tissue because the brain operates by neurons secreting neurotransmitters and firing electrical impulses. So when the neuron wants to talk to another neuron, what results is a electrical impulse, which is called an act potential or a spike, travels down the axon, reaches the end of the axon, and causes neurotransmitter release, and then that chain binds to the neuron and changes its response properties. And 100 billion neurons do this, and through uh, mystery that we are still struggling to understand allows me to stand up here and talk and hopefully for you to understand what I am saying. This electrical impulse is due to the result of sodium and potassium dancing across the neural membrane. And so to show this, the, the electric fields that neuro, neurons generate are so small that you need to stick electrodes in tissue. You can't record it outside the body. And so for this reason we use insects um, because the insects have remarkable regeneration capabilities, so uh, we can do some experiments on their legs, and the legs grow back within 100 days. So it's an experiment on animals, uh, which we, we can't avoid that, but this is the most humane preparation I've found. An insect does have a nervous system, uh, as do we, and so if we want to <coughs> understand how neurons function, we can use the cockroach as a model organism. And so I did this during a break. You'll notice, um, is there a laser pointer on this? No? Okay. There is? Anyway. All right, so that point where I say cut here is a very weak joint. It's designed to break like the tail of a lizard. So the leg comes off quite easily and uh, regrows quite quickly. And the leg is still alive and can generate electrical impulses for up to five hours. So it's a very nice preparation for teaching. And so I have one right here. This is a cockroach leg on our invention. Our invention is called the Spiker Box. It's an amplifier. The neural discharges that are generated by the neurons in the leg are approximately one millivolt, and so that's quite small. We need about, uh, we need to amplify it, and so this was our first invention, which is a inexpensive, less than $100, bioamp that allows you to gain access to understanding how neurons work. And so I'm going to turn it on. If we're lucky, we should hear something. So you can hear maybe a faint hiss and some popping in the background. I'm going to make it louder. Welcome to my lab. If you want to work in my lab, you can come up here. That's an academic joke. Um, yeah. So here's my little lab of neuroscience. And so I can make it a little bit louder for you. Fix it quickly. 
And should I do that? Of course I should. Okay. So I'll just remove this battery. Touch the leg. charges a, a thousand times and this was the first time uh, the first prototype and since then we now have it working you can see over there an electrical impulse generated by a neuron and during a break I'll get this thing working I'm not leaving this library <laughs> <laughs> and so these are what the neural impulses look like I um, you can see the neural impulses are generated when I touch the light bar what happens is there's an increase in the neural discharge rate um, you can put the put the cockroach leg inside the refrigerator, and uh, the activity goes away. And if you take it out, it returns. It tells you it's biological. Okay, I do a lot of work in South America, so excuse the Spanish. So neurons fire electrical impulses, and your muscles do too. So when you decide to move a muscle, what happens is an upper motor neuron make, uh, travels to your spinal cord, makes a synapse on a lower motor neuron, which makes a synapse on a muscle fiber. Um, and then acetylcholine is released, binds to the muscle fiber, and the voltage inside versus outside the muscle fiber changes. If it reaches a threshold, it fires an impulse, and this impulse is the command signal for contraction. So we can see this in a human because the electrical signals that muscles generate are larger than neurons, so I don't need to use a cockroach like. So I need a human. Is there any human here to come up for me to do a recording? Don't be shy. Yeah, very good, thank you. Yeah. So this is the human version of the amplifier, and if we're lucky, please oh please, this should work. All right, so I just need your form. Yeah, you get to keep the electrodes. So, in your arm, yeah. All right, so just expose you the muscle of your forearm here. Um, okay, I'm gonna put one electrode here, one electrode here, I'm gonna hook up the, the electrodes. Yeah, so. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, so what's your name? Uh, Becky. Okay, so come a little bit closer, please. Uh, so I'm going to hook up this signal A and B, and then just hold ground in your hand, maintain contact. Now flex. Yay. Now flex again. Everybody hear that? That is the sound of her muscle fibers firing electrical impulses as she rolls a contraction. We can look at it, but we can also see it with an application we have developed. Um, so let me just plug this in here. All right, so we can hear it, we can also see it. So. All right, flex. Everybody see that? Yeah. We're invading her privacy right now <laughs> by sharing the electrical impulses generated by her own muscle tissue. So can I touch her hand? Don't resist me. If I passively move her hand, do we see anything? Now resist me when I pull. Now her hand's not moving, but look, there's activity. Yeah, so this is the process of contraction. This actually happens before contraction, but it happens so fast our brain cannot perceive it. Okay? Thank you. Okay, so so you know you can do experiments on humans, and that's kind of exciting. Uh, <laughs> way. Okay, and so there's some experiments with some students. All right, and so this was a, another thing we came up with that 
Um, with the experiments on the cockroach, uh, you have to remove the leg. Um, it'd be nice to try to learn a little bit about learning and behavior. So we've designed a small little backpack. And what this backpack does is it stimulates the antenna neurons. What results is that the cockroach perceives that it's a gust of wind or a barrier, and it'll turn and move in the opposite direction. And so here's a little roboroach. Roboroach in class. This is the development of the prototype. And then can you play the movie? Yeah. I also have one of these, and I can show it at the break, but you guys won't be able to see it. Um, all right, so there's, there's an early version. So he's walking, and then you know, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I stimulate with the light, it's stimulating the antenna, and the cockroach moves in the other direction. It only works for about a minute or two because the cockroach learns to ignore the stimulation because <laughs> learning is what neurons do. I mean, one of there's my, uh, you know, there's just a lot of educators in the audience. So see, there's a remote control. You know, okay, now we can switch back to the, yeah. all right, oh no, all right, all right, so now we have a version that's Bluetooth, so we can actually control the stimulation more precisely. This was a collaboration with some Chilean engineers, uh, so now this is the new version with, uh, that allows you to stimulate at any frequency and any pulse duration. We sell it for less than $100, not because I'm trying to advertise it, but because competing systems are $5,000 dollars don't work well. And we are the first ones to release this so that scientists all around the world can start doing experiments on learning how neural circuits operate. You know, yeah. And this, this is an example of a, uh, a demo uh, we were doing in the streets of Valparaiso. Okay, so... <laughs> So it's a tragedy of mammalian neuroscience that if you break your spinal cord, it does not regrow. Lizards, chickens, most of the animals have, can regrow, regrow the neurons. But humans can't, mammals can't, and we don't really understand why yet. So, but there is a growing field which I did my graduate work on, which is called neuroprosthetics. That the, if you break your spinal cord, unfortunately, your, your brain is alive, your muscles are alive, but the connection between it is broken. So if we could read the signals out of the brain, and then stimulate the muscles, perhaps we could design some form of treatment. And these actually do exist. And there are, you can also, if you have a limb missing, you can use the electrical signals generated by your muscles to perhaps control the arm. And this is kind of an idealization, but this technology does exist. Uh, the most famous example is actually an Ohio invention at Case Western. So that's one of the best uh, institutions uh, in this field. And so we are not designing robotic arms to help people with injury. We design scientific and educational tools. But again, to work on this stuff, there's only a few labs in the world that do this, and they're quite prestigious, um, and the equipment is quite expensive. So maybe we could actually allow people to gain access to this technology at an earlier age. You know, things that I would have liked to do, you know, that wasn't offered at St. John's, and I'm not at St. John's, because we only offered any high school, offer the tools that allow people who want to become neuroscientists to start studying it as early as they want. So this is a new invention we just released. It's called the EMG Spiker Shield. We are using a popular microcontroller that allows you to use your muscle activity to control robotic devices. So I need another human, please. All right. I need two anyway, so you, can, you both can come up. All right. So what's your name? Nick. Nick. So I'm going to record from, I'm going to, I need your forearm. How much time do I have? Uh, you're 13 and a half. OK, good. I have plenty of time. OK, so right. And so now I'm going to put that right there. And so this is the other, the other in invention, it's this thing. So what Nick is going to, I'm going to hook it up to Nick. And the more Nick flexes, we're amplifying the electrical current in his arms. And it's going to control this bank of lights. So we should see more lights light up with more muscle activation or more contraction. Uh, so just give me a second to hook it up. Um, it won't hurt. We're just recording. So don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> that we're going to be doing mother more stuff in a little soon. So, I'm going to turn this on, hook this up, I'm going to plug this in, all right, bueno. Okay, now um, come a little bit closer here, Nick. Okay, let's, all right, and then hold that background. Okay, I'm going to turn this on. That right, flex. All right, does everybody see that? The more he flexes, the more lights turn on. Everybody see that? Yeah. So this is just, we're just, it's a, it's a simple demo, but you get the idea that once we have the signal, we can do whatever we want with it. And just for this demo, I have a controlling lights. We can use it to control a video game, you know, a robot, or another person. 
So one of the criticisms of the RoboRoach is, how would you like it if someone controlled you with micro-simulation? And our response was, that is a great idea. So, so I need you to come up. Okay. All right. So this is brand new. Um, we just started, we just released this last week, so some of you guys, you are some of the first people in the world to see it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is stimulate your ulnar nerve. It doesn't hurt, but it does feel a little weird. So just, uh, I need you to expose your, your forearm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you want to it a little bit? All right. So just. All right. So what's your name? Steve. Steve. Okay. So now, so just relax, Nick, while I hook him up. So what hap What's going to happen is that when Nick contracts, <laughs> we're going to send a command signal to this stimulator such that when he moves, then his arm moves. So it's a human-human interface. <laughs> so, so now we, he will take about 0.1% of his free will away from him. So this is a, you know, um, I'll have this demo going um, during the break as well if some of you want to try it out or just want to control me. Um, so, all right. Uh, all right, so relax your fingers so the audience can kind of see. Just kind of do this, hold it like that, okay? All right, I'm gonna turn it on. I'm sure put on a low setting at first. <laughs> Um, and tell me if you feel anything. All right, you're at three. All right, good. Now contract. Did you feel anything? Okay, so can I turn it up? All right. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're at five. I can turn it up more and you'll actually like, do you want it more? Oh, just, just a little bit more? All right, All right no? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right, great. So thank you. Um, uh, all right, so this is we're just beginning. Uh, this was just released, but like, uh, like, like I said, you can use this signal for anything. So these are two Chilean inventors. Okay, two minutes, great. And they've invented a robotic hand that you can see in the bottom. And so I'm working on improving the interface so you can control, record from individual muscles. And now you can have high school students programming prosthetic hands and using muscle signals as an input. And this is really advanced graduate level work, but there's no technological reason why it can't be, this technology can't be in the hands of anyone who wants it. So, uh, there's the hacker hand, that's, that's the hand. And uh, this is done also, we worked with us, uh, high school students on these inventions. A version of this was actually an invention of a 16 year old Chilean high school student I worked with. And so this began as an idea about four years ago, and since then we've been traveling to various parts of the country and world, uh, teaching neuroscience. This is rural Patagonia, they have no scientific instruments in their school, but now they do. Uh, and then we run a lot of workshops where the public can learn a little bit about how amplifiers work and how their, their bodies work. And so and we've also helped start the first community lab, uh, the Santiago Makerspace. Uh, I was speaking with uh, my old cross country coach about this, about and it's, an, it's, it's an interesting time to be alive because they we're seeing the growth of more and more community labs. Libraries serve a, libraries serve a social function, um, and some libraries even having some maker spaces with 3D printers and laser cutters and stuff like that, so people can start building things, which is really fun for me and for a lot of people as well. So this just started as an idea three years ago, uh, four years ago, and we're now in 60 countries and all 50 U.S. states. Uh, you can see the distribution here. We started in the Midwest, so you can see all the dots in Ohio, <laughs> Michigan, Illinois. So thank you so much for your time. I'll be doing a demo on the break, and you can also contact me here. So.